it's so disturbing, quite disturbing that a lot of the things you read about our investigation and prosecution, they are quite a number of it are far from the truth. Far. And sometimes I sit down and I listen to TV commentaries, commentators, I mean commentators, people talking on TV and the commentaries, and I begin to wonder, where did they get these stories from? And somebody will be telling us, ah, because you are not giving us stories. How do I give you stories? Do you look for the stories? Will I be going from one media house to another to be sharing stories? No. As media, as civil society, you work with us. We need to collaborate. And that's what we have discovered in this tour, for you to do what, because you see, everything you say as a civil society practitioners, as media men, people believe you and people run with it. And so it's extremely key, uh, important for us to be, uh, to be very careful about what we say, particularly those of us who make commentaries on TVs. There are some of these programs that I must listen to before I leave my house. For example, the AIT, Kakaki. I don't miss it every day, except I have to get to office before 7. Occasionally, if I'm chanced, I listen to TVC. Um, what is what you, what's, um, journalist anger out. I don't normally do it in the evening, but when I get around 11, if I'm home on time, I listen to it, the repeat section. And I discovered that some of the things people say on some of these programs are not even correct in the first place. And these are the people that you know, are able to convince the mind of the public. So it's extremely important for us. Maybe before we leave this place today, we need to find a way. Because you must also understand that it's not everything we do that is expedient for us to put out there because of the sensitive nature of our work. Uh, so maybe before you leave, after my address, after the engagement, we just find probably a way of working together, you know, in a way that you will understand what we're doing, so that before you go out there, at least have a bit of understanding of what we do, so that you know what to take out to the public. So on this note, once again, I want to thank you very much for coming. Uh, first of all, I'd like to brief you about a few uh, innovations we have brought in and also some restructuring that are taking place in the FCC. Uh, I want to talk to you about three main things. Number one, I mean majors in number one, the restructuring agenda we, are, we have embarked on and it, it's ongoing as well. And number two, development in certain sectors of our economy. And number three, the current uh, um, you know, prosecution of um, Yaya Bello. I woke up this morning and um, I struggled to, I went to bed around 3 a.m. I struggled to stand up around 5 a.m. when I wanted to prepare for work. So I sat on my bed trying to ruminate over what is going on. and. Um, mm my schedule for the day. A proverb came to my mind, and I want to encourage you with that proverb. The elders have been saying in my place, you know, you know a ram, a ram usually have a big scrotum. So, you know a ram? You've eaten ram before. With testicles in the scrotum, always big. And any time the ram is, um, Anytime the ram is moving around or running, you will feel that the scrotum is going to cut off. Because sometimes whether it's the ram that is shaking the scrotum or the scrotum that is shaking the ram, you can't tell. But for years, you see, this, you see that pendulum dangling. It will swing, it will dang, but it will never cut off. So EFCC, we will receive all the attacks and all of that, but we are not going to give up. We will do this work. This pendulum will not cut. It doesn't matter who is attack, attacking us. We have this mandate. We will continue to do it until you are asked to stay off the stage. So I've been uh, asked to see areas where we need to moderate things. We need to tell you not to report. But you know there is nothing you will tell. If what you don't want them to report, don't tell them. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't tell them what I don't want them to report. I know them. If we say don't want to report it, they will report it. Yeah. So God, they are my people. We know ourselves. 
Thank you very much. On the for, on first note, I, we have embarked on some restructuring. Because we must understand the war against corruption is not the amount of investigation I do out there. We must understand this thing. And as a nation, we must come together to agree, at least for once. Let us move forward. Let us get out of this mess for once. But it's like, as much as we plead with people to see the reason why we need to come together and fight this battle, the more difficult things become. I see people don't even understand. And I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again. If EFCC fails, I've not failed, though. I've never failed, and I won't fail. It is all of us. It is Nigeria that has failed. Because he, he, come, he who comes to equity. So I must be clear. I'm not proud of any operative who indulges in corruption. We can't say you are fighting corruption, and you yourself, you are, your hands are soiled. So gradually, I'm not promising that you will not see be seeing one or two elements who will still be doing some inordinate, inordinate things that as much as it lies in our power and as much as we discover them, we do something. And I promise them, I'm not just going to arrest you or dismiss you. I will prosecute you. So we have one or two cases we are preparing now. And I'm going to prosecute them, my staff. We are going to do that. And so we have created the Fraud Risk Assessment and Control Department as one of our new initiatives. And what do we do? I, I spoke about this during the launch of our uh, program at Yaradwa Center a couple of months ago, the Interfaith uh, Manual, Teaching Manual and uh, Prevention Program. And I said, we are going to start with the villa. Some people took, went to town and I said, and I, said I, I said, I wanted to investigate the president. I said, I wanted to investigate the CDN. And some people are even saying they will pray for me as if as if, uh, you know, I said something new. They wouldn't even understand what I was even talking about. Now, the essence of doing that is for us to look at our systems and processes. Gentlemen, if we don't address the problem with our systems and processes, a thousand ELCC with one million ICPC will not do anything. But when we go, look, countries where you, they are able to mitigate the effect of corruption, there are countries that understand or put processes in place, block leakages, and things that can deter people from corruption. That is the best and the fastest and the surest way of fighting corruption. And so what we did is to look at our processes. And I said we began with the state house. So when we talk of state house, there is nothing so special there. What we did, so special in terms of the fact that, I mean, you know, Relating to the fact that it's a place we can't go into. No, no. We discuss with the, with the, with the president and say, look, Ola, go and do your work. And we sat here last month, we wrote, we wrote a letter to the chief of staff. We want to see the processes and procedure involved in your contract and procure, procurement award. And surprisingly, within a week, we receive a response. So we are working there now. We are looking at the processes. We went to the National Assembly. We wrote to them, the chairman of the National Assembly Commission. We want to see those vehicles you bought, the constituency pro pro projects you have awarded and all of that. What processes and procedures do you follow? And they have, surprisingly, we were obliged. So we are looking into that, quietly. We went to the judiciary. We wrote to the CGN. We also copied the Secretary Federal Judicial Service Commission. And they have obliged us. The regulatory authority, BPP, I wrote a letter to them. One of the areas where people steal money through contracts and procurement is this certificate of no objection. We have discovered that. We have done research and we discovered that. I said I want to see all the, the contracts, the proposal that led to certificate of, award of certificate of no objection for the past five years. They have responded. Initially, it was like, ah, no. This thing will take us one year to do and all of that. By the time I sent another letter, I gave them another seven days. Told them one or two things you will do if you don't bring us. I mean, don't oblige us. They brought it. We are working on it now. Gentlemen, these are, these are ways to fight corruption. It's not when we start making noise, handing people all over the place. In another one year, you will begin to see the effect of some of these measures we are putting in place. It's extremely important for all of us to understand 
some of these intricacies. Fighting corruption is not just for us to investigate and make noise, like some people want us to do. We have been doing it for years, even though we have recorded some successes, but have we really, has it really made much impact as expected? And the answer is no. In fact, it has not made, made much impact. Why can't we change our strategy? And that's exactly what we are doing now. And so I'm dedicating a whole directorate to, to undo that. And also we, we felt it's also important for us to look at some areas that we stimulate the economy. If you remember, that's one of also the policy objectives I shared with you. That we are going to use the instrumentality of anti-corruption to do what? To stimulate the economy. That was how, how and why we went into area of currency mutilation, um, forex smart practices and all of that. And under one month, we began to see the impact of that. I tell you, if we are not, if we were not involved in the enforcement of some of these laws, you wouldn't have so the, what the benefits we have derived from this forest malpractices and all of that, we wouldn't have gotten there at all. At all. If you go to Zone 4, I'm not sure you will see anybody displaying dollar. Some people have taken us to cleaners on the issue of spraying money and all of that. It's not the work of EFCC. It's not the responsibility of EFCC. Go and look at our law very well. I'm a lawyer myself. And I did promise I won't do anything outside the rule of law. What do you understand by economic sabotage? What is the meaning of economic crime? I'm not just only, my mandate is not only to investigate financial crimes. The mandate goes as far as investigating the economic crime. As a matter of fact, my law, Section 40, specifically gives me the, the power to investigate oil bunkering, vandalization of pipelines. I did it very well. That's why we call it a specialized agency. And so we are doing this. Why did we arrest Bob Risky? Why did we? Now, the moment we did that, people started sending videos. Ten years did that video that was recorded five years ago, ten years ago, and all of that. As you start running after that, I said, no, it doesn't work this way. Now everybody has just woken up to the reality, to the fact that this thing is wrong, and we should actually want to identify ourselves with what we're doing. If you are not making it part, people will not be rushing to send videos to us. And they call it, they say, it is the, these are the little, little forces that spoil the vine. If you don't handle those things, if you don't create that economic you know, sanity in the minds of our people, or in our environment, you will not get there. There is no nation that is, that is built or thrives on lawlessness. No nation. No matter how trivial you think the law is, we are going to apply it as far as, long, as, far as the, 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 it affects our economy. We are going to do that. And we, have, we don't have any apology. If it is not within my mandate, let the court pronounce on that. Anybody who is angry that I'm arresting people who are mutilating our currency, as if that is what that is the word practice, as if that is that we are taking pride in that, let the person go and challenge that power to prosecute, to investigate and prosecute in court. And let the court tell me I don't have the power to do it, and I will stop immediately. And I say it's not about me. It's about this country. We cannot afford what system do we want to be killed to the one coming behind us? How we get there? If we don't start now. So those areas we are going to, Yahoo boys. Some people have, they, in fact, not only abusing me, some people have gone as far as, as abusing my father who died in 1978 over the fact that I'm investigating Yahoo boys. Let me share a few things with you. Just a few things. Because you see, it's always good to have an understanding. We have been in this thing for a while. I just commissioned a project titled Understanding the Landscape, the Cybercrime Landscape. They've just given me a preliminary report. In 2022 alone, Nigeria faced a staggering onslaught of cybercrime. This thing you call Yahoo Yahoo. Wow, you might have harassing all these small, small boys all over the place. It's not small. It's not small. 2022 alone, I'm waiting for the report of 2023. We discovered that more than 71% of Nigerian industries, companies, and firms 
fell victim to cybercrime. More than 71% of these companies you see in Nigeria are operating. Now, which company is happy or will thrive on this kind of a thing? You, are, you want to attract foreign direct investment. The moment you come in, Yahoo Boys, we attack your platform. You start losing money. And you think they will stay? It's beyond what we are seeing. We are rescuing the future of Nigeria by going into this cybercrime investigation and prosecution. Now, I tell you again, within that period, the Nigerian economy lost $706 million. These companies. $706 million to cybercrime. To the activities of these guys, you call Yahoo Yahoo boys, that we don't take them serious now. Not knowing that we are sitting on a keg of gunpowder. And I go further. The alarming statistics continue with Nigerian banks losing over 8 billion era to electronic transfer fraud in the first nine months of year 2022. A system that lost over 8 billion to a particular scheme of fraud. And you are saying here, Jesus should close his eyes to that kind of scheme. Are Nigerians fear on us? Are we even fear on ourselves? i give you another one. As I'm talking to you now, we discovered in almost all the states of Nigeria, all the subnationals, we have what we call the 419 training schools everywhere. Where they harvest our young our children from primary school. They put them, when they leave their regular studies as in primary school, they close at two o'clock, they end up in some of these 419 training schools. They start indoctrinating them. These are facts. They first of all ask them, even their parents, to sign an undertaking. After that, they take, they adopt them. Some of these kids they start paying their school fees. They get indoctrinated into cybercrime, as young as they are. By the time they get to secondary school, oh. That's why you see them 100 level, 200 level, hacking, and you think they just started that way? No. And even the children of, from wealthy homes are doing it now. It has become a culture. It's a trend. And these are the people you want to be cured our future into their hands? And we don't know that responsibility is ours as their leaders to let them know that this is wrong. There's no future in this thing. To start telling them that for you to be great in life, greatness comes through hard work. Commitment to hard work. If that is the only lesson I'm able to pass across to them, by the work of, by the father, by, by, by virtue of what we're doing. I'm okay. I'm okay. Now, why Nigeria's yearly loss to internet fraud amounted to over $500 million in one year? In one year to internet fraud. According to, this is not even my report, this is part of Nigeria Communications Company, NCC. Army Communications Commission, NCC. Now, for context, the what we call the BEC, the Business Email Compromise, scam, as a category of cybercrime, is a prominent nuisance, as it accounts for 40% of all cybercrime losses across the world. And it's one of the top four major cybercrime threats. Do you know now all over the world that cybercrime is the third largest GDP, attracts the third largest GDP, GDP in the world? Go and do your research. Attracts as much as $14 trillion, the third largest GDP after US, China, is cybercrime. And you want us to sit down here and close our eyes to that? According to the FBI 
report, between 2018 and 2021, over $43 billion was lost in BECs globally. And according to the email security website, Africa accounts for 60% of all the BEDs actors, not victims, though. people perpetrating this act. Africa accounts for 60%. And of all the BED actors in a regional distribution level, why Nigeria accounts for approximately 50% of all the BECs actors globally? 60% for Africa. Out of that 60%, Nigeria has taken 50%. The remaining 10 shared among several countries. And you think we should close our eyes to that? This is just a bit of what we have discovered. This is just a bit of what we are facing. I have known people have come here weeping. They went to borrow money and they started businesses. And some of these guys penetrated their platform and they destroyed their business. And they had to fold up with debt overnight. Nigerians. Halaji, if anyone has fallen victim of this Yahoo Yahoo thing we are talking about, you understand the enormity of this problem. I was hearing with the judges now. Of course, I was even talking to them about this issue of restraining order and all of that, that they grant, you know, as if uh, you know, people drink water. Because I, can't, I don't understand. It's only in this part of the world that a state agency will be stopped perpetually from carrying out its statutory mandate. I've never seen it happen. Anyway. We got an alarm. A judge. She has been saving money for four and a half years or five years. The daughter got an admission for postgraduate studies in the UK. She needed to pay 4,500 pounds. It's advance payment. She told me I said that she has been saving money, that money for almost five years. Suddenly, in one first sweep, under one minute, her, her card was hacked. And that money was taken away. 24 hours before that, the money was supposed to be transferred for the payment of the tuition. In the same state where we have been stopped from carrying out investigations. So she made a frantic call to one of my officers there. So I asked, which state is that? When the officer called me, he said, so, so, so state. I said, well, I need to tell the job in law that uh, we have a restraining, perpetual restraining order from investigating he said, no. Eventually, I spoke with, me, with her. He said, no, my brother, eh, you know, we didn't know about this thing, blah, 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 blah all of that. Uh, even that or that, it's not uh, as if we can. I said, assuming the same bank that, you know, holds the platform where your account was hacked, the same bank got a restraining order against us. Overnight, we had to do what we needed to do. Eventually, we got the money back under wow. 24 hours. Wow. I said, now, my Lord, you are a victim. You know, we don't understand what it means to join this crusade. When we shout in left, right, and center, stop. Let us, talk. Let us join hands. Let's see. Because tomorrow, you can be a victim. Your brother is coming from America. I want to start a business. And one 17-year-old boy just sat down somewhere in Mushin or, uh, you know, or Pape, you know, and just swipe off the entire capital. The following day, spelling wrong back to where it's coming from. It doesn't happen anywhere. It doesn't happen anywhere. I brought, up, I brought in, in my Lagos of a 17-year-old boy, I was sharing also with them, who is studying history, 200 level. He never, he's not doing anything science. Nothing science. He studied history and anthropology. How many of you studied that in school? The guy sat in my office in Lagos and demonstrated some things to me on my laptop. He asked for my, account, my, my number. He knows my number. I gave him my number. Through my number, I got my BVN. He said, oh, God. I, this, he now mentioned the name of my account number to me at the bank. I didn't tell him anything. <laughs> yes. 17-year-old boy, 200-level student, studying history and anthropology. No, like, that's not even the issue. The, the problem is, I see crime in that. I also see opportunities in it. 
So if you leave these guys, if we don't make them know that this thing they are doing is wrong, if you leave them, they will continue to see that thing as a culture, as a way of life to make money. If I don't investigate them, if I don't prosecute them, now what we do, we, on our own, we plead for light sentences for them. Because it's also going to be wrong for us to close our eyes. We plead for life sentences. Why? So that we can reorientate them. Mm. And that's part of the things we're doing. What joy will I drive in sending a 19 year old boy to jail? You have destroyed his future, you have destroyed his career. Sometimes, most times, they give them options of fine and all of that, that conviction. So we bring them back, we, we, we lecture them, we talk to them. This particular boy, when he was done, he said, I said, look. He said, look, Oga, we are, I can make 10 million now. He said, I will demonstrate to you. I will move money from your account to my account now. I said, no, don't, don't that in my office. <laughs> don't let them trace that to this place. Don't. And he was actually ready to do it. In fact, when he opened the system and he was like, I didn't give, give him the key to my laptop. And he had access. He, was the, he forgot that he was even in my office. He forgot I was around him. He was just, you know, he got lost in that art. And... I said, okay, now, why do you do this? Why? You know what he told me? He said both parents are farmers. They couldn't go, go to farm because of insecurity. He has two younger ones, one in GS2 and one in SS2. He's the one feeding his parents. He's the one responsible for the payment of the tuition of his younger ones. So what do we do? In as much as I want to do my job, like I said, I, I saw a big gate in that guy. I said, okay, from today, if you are able to get out of this, we will do our work, and whatever happens, I will suddenly take up the responsibility of your schooling. I told my family, we are going to do that. I spoke to one of my friends, who is also ready to help to take up the schooling of the SSS2 guy. So I'm still looking for someone who will take up the one for the GS2. Maybe you choose Sakuna who help me do that. <laughs> you know. So these are the challenges we are facing. So for people to just sit down out there and begin to condemn ELCC, they don't even have an idea of what we're doing. You don't even understand the enormity of the problems. You don't. Now we, we are coming up with what we call the Cybercrime Research Center as part of the project in our new academy. We are, we'll bring some of these boys during the vacation, the way they are capturing them, the way we are for one night training school. We are also going to come up with a hub that will help us to channel those skills. You can imagine somebody who never studied science. Imagine his proficiency in handling systems, hacking websites. Now, assuming that guy is, that skill is channeled towards positive things, you can imagine the contribution he will make towards the economic development. So those are things we're doing. Those are the innovations we are bringing into this work. Secondly, I also want to let you know, in addition to some of this structuring agenda, the development in certain sectors of the economy, particularly illegal mining. We are going very seriously into the area of illegal mining. Gentlemen, if you see what Nigeria loses every day, every day to illegal mining, you will weep for this country. And these are areas where a lot of people don't even understand how the process is involved. So I'm talking to you. In fact, one of my key officers that I now brought in as my chief of staff is doing so much in that area, in his former zone in Iloni. I said, the last count, how many trucks of mineral resources have we seized? 40, sir. We have over 40. You know what that means? Of, of uh, lithium, lithium, lithium and all kinds of expensive Raw, uh, uh, natural resources. 40, over 40 trucks. Nigerians are the one doing it for them. Taking them to the mining sites. Doing the excavation. Doing the transportation. Doing the loading. They must have passed through ports to ship that thing out. So we are seriously going to that. 